Good afternoon. Welcome back to the second in our series of uh, three videos on the bonding in elements 1 to 20. The last time we covered metallic bonding, the fact they have delocalized electrons, they conduct electricity, that's revision purely from National 5. There's actually nothing new at higher, good news. We covered the fact that the group 8 gas, group 0 gases, whatever you want to call them, they do in fact have melting and boiling points, therefore there must be some new an unknown force sticking them together. It's not very strong because the melting and boiling points are extremely low. We explained that these were called London dispersion forces. They were caused by temporary uneven distribution of electrons, causing the molecules to have a slightly positive, slightly negative end. It only lasts for a second and then it goes. That's why it's so weak. We also covered the fact that the more electrons there are per atom, there are more the delta plus, delta minus can be separated and therefore the stronger these forces get as you go down from helium all the way down to radon. Right, that was last time. Today, we are covering the next, the third of our four structures here, which are called covalent molecules. I have gone ahead and shaded them in here. Um, I've picked out phosphorus, sulfur and chlorine in particular. You'll see why near the end of the video. So covalent molecules, uh, this hopefully is sort of a summary from National 5 as well, with that three extra things added in. There's three little bits of new content added in for higher. So here's a, here's a bunch of covalent molecules. They're sometimes called discrete molecules or individual, not discrete as in keep a secret, discrete as in separate from each other. Here's them in their solid state. And then of course you can melt them. And of course you can boil them. Now, the fact that they can be made solid indicates that uh, there must be something sticking them together. But we'll come back to that. Just a very, very quick piece of revision. Here I'm going to draw an oxygen molecule. No, let's not do oxygen, let's do chlorine. Actually, I've got a couple of chlorine molecules, let's do that for simplicity. That's 17 protons here, 17 protons here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So here's a chlorine molecule. Can I just remind you that the grey uh, the grey piece of plastic, of course, represents the shared pair of electrons. And if you remember from my hilarious Chris Hemsworth versus me comparison, I talked about the fact that uh, there's something called electron negativity, and that was the attraction between the shared pair of electrons and the positive charge in the centre. Uh, you can see that the electronegativity must be identical because these are the same element. I'm putting a little uh, mark in your subconscious for when we come to discuss compounds and it's no longer equal shared. I wonder what effect that will have. Sorry, no longer equally pulled. I apologise, these pair here. I wonder what effect that will have on the molecule. Quite a lot as it turns out. Um, so covalent bonds, here's my chlorine molecules. And I'm implying that something is sticking this one to its neighbour. Um, that's something, the good news is that something is something you already know. It's London dispersion forces all over again. Only now, it's not just the number of electrons per atom, it's the number of electrons per molecule. That will affect the strength of the London dispersion forces. Uh, and if we spin back to our periodic table again, that means as you fall down group 7 here, down the halogens, that means chlorine Fluorine, my apologies, has the least number of electrons at just 9 in each mol in each atom and therefore 18 per molecule all the way down to, uh, let's not go down to astatine because it's weird let's just stick with iodine iodine's atomic number is 53 so 106 electrons versus 18 this should have considerably stronger LDFs than this and of course that explains why iodine is solid bromine is a liquid Chlorine is a gas, and fluorine is also a gas with an even lower boiling point and melting point than this one. Great. The rule seems to work a treat. So that's one of the three new things that I thought I would throw at you. The fact that uh, these molecules, covalent molecules, are held together, that is, held to their neighbours by London dispersion forces. A famous trick question the SQA will ask you about is the strength of this covalent bond. Does it affect the boiling point? Not in the slightest. Look, I'm not breaking the bond when I melt it. I don't break this bond, I only break London dispersion forces. That's a popular point of confusion here, guys. 
uh, I actually had to make this video again because of, <laughs> I mean, I screwed up the first time around and I completely forgot to say this, so I'm really glad to have to do it twice. Um, so if that stands, then we should get boiling point or melting point against atomic number, just like we saw last time. Go back and look at the last video if you're not sure. This is group seven this time. Um, and yep, it does pretty much the same thing. Um, there's a name, by the way, there's a name for the London dispersion forces when they act between molecules. Um, and uh, it's called, two seconds, let me draw this for you. So if I were to map out the London dispersion forces between here, these are called inter molecular forces as in internet you know goes between countries or intercity goes between cities um, so these are called intermolecular forces and the particular intermolecular force that we're dealing with today as I said earlier on are London dispersion forces so are we done then does that explain all behaviours in the periodic table? There are two things left to do. Number one, why did I zero in on these three elements here? Because the, the SQA wants you to know about them. And if we check out these elements, we find that um, element number 15 is phosphorus, element number 16 is sulphur, and element number 17 is chlorine. Now, if I were to go and look up the boiling points, let's see if I can get them right this time. Um, the boiling point of phosphorus is plus 44. The boiling point of chlorine is at minus 101. And the boiling point... I said chlorine. I'm looking at sulfur. My apologies, guys. Let's just fix that for a second. I shouldn't try and multitask. <laughs> the boiling point of sulfur is plus 112. And the boiling point of chlorine is minus 101. Now, that looks to be broken at first glance because this has the most electrons and yet it has the lowest melting point, boiling point. And this, what's going on here? Have we gone wrong? No, we have not gone wrong. We've just made one assumption that is incorrect because we know that chlorine goes about in pairs and we're just assuming it's the same story for these. I've got some nice pretty pictures here which will let us see that nothing is broken after all and the rules that I told you still do indeed work because chlorine is indeed a diatomic 34 electrons per molecule sulfur turns out to be octaatomic it goes about in little rings of 8 in fact and the SQA do want you to know this they often ask about it it's a favourite for open-ended questions so 128 electrons for the molecule and phosphorus goes about in this cool wee tetrahedron structure so that's actually p4 so if we have a quick look again this is the least electrons lowest this is the middle amount middle amount and this is the highest good turns out the rules aren't broken after all and everything's fine that's the second thing that i want you to know about there are th these three weirdos when it comes to diatomic octaatomic and tetraatomic what's the last thing well i'm going to go all the way back to the periodic table here you notice i didn't include carbon and you're probably thinking, of course you don't include carbon. Carbon's diamond. It's not individual molecules. Carbon is unique. Carbon can do all sorts of weird things. And one of the weird things it can do is that it can have lots of different forms. They're called allotropes. It's like different flavors, different structures of carbon. And it turns out that one of the allotropes of carbon looks like this. We found it in deep space uh, back in the 80s. We found that you can make it remarkably easily here on Earth, and it is a single molecule. That's why it comes under the heading of covalent molecules, not covalent networks, which is what the last one is. So you could have multiple of these sitting next to each other, and the only thing holding this to its neighbour would be LDFs, not covalent bonds. So that is definitely a, an individual molecule. It's even got a name. They, want, they, being the SQA, want you to know the name and they want you to know the formula, and that's the last thing for today. Its formula is C, of course, carbon, but there are 60 atoms in the molecule. Um, blimey. 60 atoms, each with 6 electrons, of course, means there's 360 electrons per molecule. 
that's a fair whack. So that means the LDFs are strong enough for this to be a solid at room temperature. Uh, and its name was named after uh, Mr. Buckminster Fuller. So <laughs> this is, I know, a bit of a mouthful. Buckminster Fullerine. There's a whole bunch of these. If you're interested, go and Google them. The, I think, will be replacing copper wires and computer circuits by the time you're my age. I strongly suspect that. We're going to make nano wires made of carbon tubes. Um, Buckminster Fuller, by the way, was a guy who designed uh, fancy domes and all sorts of structures. And this is, I'm not a footballist, but apparently it's really popular as the sport goes. Um, but this, somebody tells me, is exactly the same structure as a football, alternating pentagons and hexagons. Turns out to be correct. That's the end of this video, guys. Next time we're going to have a look at um, giant covalent just giant covalent networks. The good news is that will be a super short one. Thank you for listening. Thanks for your patience.